we are absolutely delighted to have with us Matt Pierce, uh, who comes from the Office of Education at uh, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Science, uh, Space Studies, right here in New York City. Here's Matt Pierce. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Pierce, and thank you for coming out tonight. I appreciate that we have this, this unique space for all of these great math enthusiasts. I also want to thank Cindy Lawrence and the rest of the MoMath team for organizing this event. Um, one of the things that, that we do at NASA, we're very focused on improving STEM education, and my role is to help and support all education institutions from K to all the way through postdoctorate and universities and high schools and museums to engage with NASA in meaningful ways and to try and help and promote STEM education. And if you ever have any education inquiries for NASA, please contact me. It is a real privilege tonight to introduce Dr. Gavin Schmidt. He is the director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He is an extraordinary mathematician who is here to talk to you tonight about the great work we're doing and that he's done. So please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Gavin Schmidt. <laughs> oh yeah, that was much shorter than the first time. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out. Um, uh, as, as Matt said, I'm the director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, which, which if you didn't know, um, is, uh, sits on top of Tom's Restaurant, um, which I, I think it was used in some TV show or something, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and we're, uh, we're five of the, the floors on, on top of that, um, 112th and Broadway. Uh, we are the only NASA institute that's, uh, that's in a big city. Uh, we are the smallest NASA institute uh, that there is, but I think that we, uh, we punch above our weight. So um, we do a lot of stuff on, on climate change and climate modeling and climate impacts and, 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 and the like. Um, but I'm going uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start um, this conversation really talking about something that's, that's, that's more, more mathematical, the, the notion of, of, of chaos. So what are you seeing? Clouds. 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 What are you seeing? Is, is, is this real or is it a computer simulation? Hands up if you think it's real. And hands up if you think it's a computer simulation. So real? Real. real? OK, computer simulation. And uh, people who don't know. Okay, yeah, there was a lot of you there. I noticed, I noticed. Um, okay, so here's a clue. If somebody shows you an, uh, a, a visualization of clouds and there isn't a night and day pattern, uh, then it's a computer simulation, right? So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is multiple days, and you can see this kind of like this fog that kind of comes down. That's actually a, a, a diurnal cycle. So uh, in the real world, of course, it would be dark and you wouldn't see the clouds. Um, this is a computer simulation. Uh, it's quite a high-resolution computer simulation, and it looks real, right? It has patterns, it has emergent properties that remind you of satellite images, that remind you of things that you've seen. You know, these kind of uh, roll uh, vortices that come off the, the coast, uh, patterns of, um, uh, you know, frontal systems that are coming uh, across from, from the ocean, uh, spotty little convection in, in the... Uh, in the Caribbean. All of these things are emergent properties of this simulation. There isn't a particular calculation that says, move this cloud over here and make it look a little bit like that. No, it's, it's a combination of all the different physics that's going on. But there are some other very interesting things about these simulations. It looks familiar, yet it doesn't ever repeat. Just like the real world, you see the same kinds of phenomena coming through, but it never exactly matches the same time that you know, that front came through last time. It's not ever exactly the same. And that is a characteristic of a system that's chaotic. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So um, we're in a math uh, museum, right? We're not afraid of equations, right? We're not afraid of equations, right? No. Okay, yes, yes, okay. So we're, we're not, you know, um, three, uh, three uh, variables, uh, ordinary differential equations, a little bit of nonlinearity going on there, a couple of parameters. Doesn't look like very much. And yet, this is the system that Ed Lorentz was working with 
back in the early 1960s when he made a very interesting discovery. So uh, this is an encapsulation of some kind of large-scale ideas uh, about how the atmospheric circulation works. Um, but you don't really need to worry about where the, where the equations came from. Um, but he was, uh, he was chugging through it on a, on, a, on a computer at the time that was uh, extremely powerful. Um, of course, uh, anybody here who has a smartphone has a computer that's a billion times faster than the computer that he was working on then. Um, and, uh, and it would churn through this, you know, it would update X and update Y and update, update Z and then keep on going. And he saw these very interesting patterns. And, uh, you know, one day he came back in and he had all these, uh, had all these numbers, like the X was like 10, 10 decimal points, Y was 10 decimal points. And he said, well, you know what, I can't be bothered to write up I would put back in you know, all of those decimal points. I'm just going to put in the first five. Thinking that, that that would be enough. And you would just continue along the same path. But what happened instead was that the solution that he'd had before and the solution that he did now diverged very quickly and had completely different patterns of, on a very, very short time scale. And most people would have looked at that and said, oh, oh well, this is just rubbish. I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Throw it all out. But he said, no, actually, this is very interesting. Like, what, how, how close does it need to be before these things diverge? And what he found was that it didn't matter how small the difference was, it would still diverge. Okay? And so if you actually plot the answers, uh, if you plot the solutions for this, um, you, you can, you can kind of see what it does. So this is where we're starting. Right? This is our initial condition. Right? And this is uh, the y and z axes. And the color is, is, the, is the amount of x. Right? So we're just kind of going through in time. And you can see it's kind of looping around. It's kind of happy in its little, little kind of area. You think, oh, well, it's pretty predictable. It's, oh, no, no. OK, just <laughs> where did it go? OK, now, it, now it's over there. OK, oh, well, now it's back over there. And what you're seeing is something that, if you look at it statistically, is actually unpredictable. Right? It flips from one side to the other, from small to large. And, uh, and what, you, what you're seeing is, is a solution that, that doesn't look like something simple. It doesn't go to a fixed point. It doesn't go around in an oscillation. It looks complex. It looks a little bit like the real world. The pattern that you get when you do this for many, many, many iterations um, always looks the same, but again, never repeats itself. Right? But the pattern, these lobes that you see, always comes up. It doesn't matter where you start. But it never quite repeats itself. And this is what's, uh, what's been described as, as Lorentz's uh, butterfly. Right? And if you, if you looked at this in slightly different dimensions, you'd see these two lobes kind of in, in three-dimensional space. And every time you start, you'll find it going around one of them, and then it will flip and then it will flip, and then it will flip in a, in a way that appears to be random. But it's not random. It's totally deterministic, right? You know exactly where you're going. But it appears to look uh, random. And so they, we call those strange attractors because they don't look like normal attractors. And for those of you with a numerical bent, remember this number, r equals 28, OK? What Lorentz noticed was that if you start very close to the point where you started before, initially it will follow the same pattern. So the blue and the red are following each other. But after a while, you can start to see them diverge. And initially, when it's doing that kind of loopiness, it's just kind of, OK, well, it's slowly diverging. Nothing like, you know, one of them is tracking the other. You can say that you can make a prediction of the red one using the blue one. Right? But now they're kind of getting a little bit further apart and further apart and further apart. And now the red one's gone completely off. <laughs> OK, so like now they've diverged. Right Now I can't use the red one to track the blue one. And this is what's called a sensitive dependence on initial condition. Right? For a system that is more dissipative, or a, a normal dynamical system, like a, like a pendulum, right? If I just have a pendulum, and I change where it starts, you know, it's going to end up pretty much in the same place. It doesn't go completely crazy. Though I'll show you uh, a, a case where it does. 
it doesn't have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. It doesn't really matter where you start. But these systems do, right? It does matter where you start. And that rate at which these things diverge is actually a characteristic of all chaotic systems. And the reason why we care about this chaotic system is not because of this chaotic system itself, but because it stands in for lots of other systems that we do care a lot more about. Let's take a quick look at a simulation uh, of the weather, or uh, parts of the weather. The key things that were in the Lorentz equation were nonlinearity and feedback. The x's and the y's impacted the z's, which impacted the x's, which impacted the y's, et cetera, in a loop. Right? And you have to have both of those ingredients. In the real world, and this is a simulation, again, this is a simulation, not, this is not a this is not a photograph. Um, this is a simulation of, of particles in the air. So you can see the, uh, the orange particles, that's dust, right? That's coming off the deserts, right? As the wind uh, changes the amount of, uh, of uplift, you get more or less dust in the air. Uh, these blue patterns, this is sea salt that's being whipped up by the winds in this tropical cyclone as it goes into the Pacific. Uh, these red dots are fires that were existing um, in September 2006. Uh, and the green is uh, black carbon and organic carbon that's coming from those fires. The white that you can see is pollution from uh, burning of, uh, of high sulfurous coal. And what you can see is very clearly that the winds and the climate are changing these distributions. And because these are particles, you can see them. You can you know, if you look in the air, the, the air becomes more or less opaque. These particles are in themselves having an effect on climate. And so we have all of the ingredients, right? We have the climate affecting its composition, which affects the climate. And all of these things are highly nonlinear, right? So we have all of the ingredients that we might expect for chaotic behavior. And in fact, that is what you see in these models. These models have that same sensitive dependence on initial conditions that you saw in the Lorentz uh, equations. If I change the last um, decimal point of the smallest number in this system, it will diverge. And after about a month, you'll be on a totally different uh, weather regime. Right? So we know that these models are chaotic in exactly the same way that the Lorentz uh, model is chaotic. Um, there was a volcano. I, d I missed, I missed uh, pointing out that there was a volcano. But there was a volcano that went off. But never mind. Okay. Yeah. I talk too much. That's my problem. So how do we do weather forecasts? Given that the system is chaotic, given that there's this huge dependence on initial conditions, how do we make weather forecasts? How do we, how do we, how do, we do anything successful? And the reason... The, 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 the way that that works um, comes about uh, from, from this kind of uh, understanding. So here's another view of that Lorentz butterfly. Okay? Now, remember that if I start here, if the real world is there, and I start just a little bit away from it, I will diverge at some point. Given that I don't know exactly where I am in the real world, right? I don't have perfect observations. We don't have observations of temperature and humidity everywhere in the world. Um, we know that sometimes measurements are biased. You know, somebody might have written down uh, the wrong number. Uh, sometimes the, the, the thermometer itself is uh, miscalibrated or something. So we know that there are errors in the observations. We know that the observations are not complete. So there's no point in thinking that we can just go to exactly where the observations are and track the exact point uh, that is going to tell us exactly where we're going to go. So we can't do that. So what do we do instead? So instead, what we do is we say, OK, well, we think we're roughly around here. And we're going to take a whole bunch of different simulations. And we're going to seed them around where the observations are. And we're going to use the fact that over a short time period, all of these things will track to say something on average about where the weather or weather trajectory is going to go. And that can work well or badly, depending on where you are. So ideally, this would, be, this would be a good case. You start off over there, 
and there isn't a lot of divergence, and it goes off into this other lobe, and there still isn't a lot of divergence. And in this case, you would have a good, solid uh, prediction of where you're going to be in five, ten days' uh, time. You might be closer to a bifurcation point, in which case, you know, you'd start off close together, but very quickly the different, uh, the different solutions would diverge. And that would tell you that you don't have very much predictability that you can't go kind of beyond this point in saying what was going to happen. And of course, if you start very close to a, uh, a bifurcation point itself, um, it, might go, uh, it might diverge very, very quickly indeed, at which point you have no predictability at all. But the fact that you know that you can track things even for a short time means that you can do this ensemble forecasting. And most of the time, and the, the, the ensemble itself will tell you when there is predictability and when there isn't. So that's the basis of the success that we've had in weather forecasting. And you can see that, uh, that the forecasting has, in fact, got much, much better over time. So let me walk you through this, because this is a little bit complicated. So um, on this side over here, this is, uh, this is a skill score. So a perfect model right, would, would, uh, would verify at 100%. Right? So you have exactly the right amount of rainfall, the exact same amount of of pressure changes, uh, temperature, and all the rest. Obviously, no model gets that far. The blue, the brown, and the green, and the yellow are different time horizons. So this is the forecast uh, to three days. This is the five-day forecast, the seven-day forecast, and the 10-day forecast. Okay? And then this is time. The two lines that you're seeing for each color are the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Right. So. Let's take the three-day forecast uh, to start with. Back in the, uh, in the 1980s, the northern hemisphere was much easier to forecast than the southern hemisphere. Now, it's not because we think that the, uh, that the, that the physics of, uh, of climate are different in the southern hemisphere, and we didn't know them. Um, it's just we didn't have as much data. Right? Um, and so because we didn't have as much data, uh, we weren't able to do as, as good a job. But as you can see, over time, there have been lots of improvements. The improvements have been because of data and because of our understanding of the system. And so now, the three-day forecast kind of verifies at like 98%, right? That's pretty good. Now, if you look at the five-day forecast, the five-day forecast now is as good as the three-day forecast was in 1984, right? So in 30 years, we've got an extra two days of predictability. I know, that doesn't seem great, but it's actually really impressive. No, it's good, it's good, right? The seven-day the seven day forecast, the seven-day forecast is pretty much where the, the, uh, the three-day forecast was 30, 40 years ago, okay? That's really impressive. And you can see that the gap between the three-day and the five-day and the five-day and the seven-day and the seven-day to the ten-day keeps on increasing. And that's part of that divergence that you're seeing Right? It's much harder to do a 10-day forecast than it is to do a three-day forecast. Right? It's not just three times as hard. So the 10-day forecasts are still not very good. Right? So um, you might ask yourself, why on the TV news do they often give you 10-day forecasts? <laughs> you may ask. I have asked. I have actually asked. <laughs> I have actually asked. And what they tell me is that people want them. It doesn't matter that they're not any good. <laughs> But people, if people want something, they shall have it, <laughs> apparently, or for TV news, anyway. Um, so mostly 10-day forecasts are useless for any kind of practical planning purpose. Um, but uh, three-day forecasts are very good. Five-day forecasts are, uh, are very good. And the seven-day forecast is kind of uh, is, is, is usable. Now, OK, we're going, to have a, we're going to have a little break here so that you can really kind of get a visceral feel of what, what sensitive dependence on initial conditions uh, means. So underneath your chairs, right, there is a, uh, a little toy. Um, so, so feel free to, uh, to pick it up. There's one for every two chairs, so you're going to have to share with your neighbors. I realize that's not a very New York thing to do, but let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's make it work. OK. So uh, what you have here is there's a little magnet in the ball. And there are magnets in the, uh, in the base. And uh, this is actually a chaotic system. So what we're going to do, 
um, is, uh, is do our own uh, test of this. So we're going to try and do the same thing over and over again. OK, so hold the ball like next to the, uh, next to the stand. And then just let it go. You don't need to shake it very far. And it should end up somewhere. OK, everybody got that? All right, so let's have a little quick, um, uh, a quick poll. Uh, who, uh, who got a yes, go for it? OK, who got a no way? Who got a sleep on it? Who got a maybe? All right, who got absolutely? Yep, who got to ask a friend? Uh, who got that's crazy? <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> All right, and who said no? Uh, no idea, ask again. OK. So that was actually pretty evenly distributed, as if it was random. But you know it wasn't, right? OK, so we're going to do it again. Right? So put it back to where you had it before, as close as you possibly could to exactly where it was. And we're going to try it again. OK. Who got the same answer as they had the first time? Oh, I see. That's, 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 that's about right. It's like a one in eight thing, right? So um, uh, most of you didn't, because in fact, you aren't able to put this close enough to exactly where you had it before, and the conditions aren't quite right, because your hand is wobbling and things, uh, that you're not able to reproduce it exactly. So you started off with something that looked like it was going to be close to the, to the trajectory that you started with, but in fact, you ended up diverging quite a long way. And you can keep on playing with this. And you can have it ask questions. So for instance, the, um, the weather forecast for Friday uh, calls for 75 degrees uh, maximum. So, so is that going to happen? I mean, mine says maybe, which is, which is usually a pretty good answer. Ooh, spooky. OK, so you can continue to play with this. And if you try and, uh, and, try and make it predictable, you'll find that, that you won't be able to. All right. So you might say, you might say, oh, well, there's no predictability here. It's effectively just random. And, and you'd say, OK, well, well, I don't know about that. What if I turn it upside down? Well, now it's totally predictable. Right? If I change the boundary condition, I can do things that are actually more predictable. So I can have chaotic behavior in certain regimes and for certain initial conditions, but I can change the background states and I can still say something that's predictable about that system. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how that actually works. So you remember the number that I asked people to remember earlier on? R equals 28, yes. Oh, OK, hold on. That's not what I wanted. OK, there we go. OK, so it turns out that the Lorentz attractor is chaotic between 24.2 and 30. Nobody knows why. It just is. There's something very interesting that happens when R is greater than 117. Um, and if any of you are, are coders uh, or you want to play around with this, it takes about five minutes to code up. And you can, just, uh, you can play with all of those numbers uh, very, very straightforwardly. But anyway, so if you think about the difference between R equals 24 and R equals 30, that's a boundary condition change. You know, I, haven't, I, haven't really, I didn't change the initial conditions. They were the same. But I changed the basic structure of the equation. And it turns out that even though both of them look like they're Lorentz attractors, they're different, right? So this one is lower down and smaller. And this one is bigger and slightly higher up. And the points in the middle around which they oscillate have changed. And it turns out that that is actually predictable. Even though the individual trajectories are not, that's the weather, the structure of the attractor itself is predictable. That change. That's the climate. That's the climate of these attractors. So let's talk a little bit about climate change. So this is global warming. Ooh. Um, people look at this graph, and, uh, and people see a lot of different things. Uh, some people see a lot of dots. 
Other people see the red line. Other people notice the scale on the side. So given that people see different things, let me point out a few things on this graph uh, that's, that I think are, worth, are worthy of note. So the individual dots, the black squares there, that's individual years that are somewhat warmer, somewhat colder, depending on, on various things like the weather. It's not noise. It's not uncertainty. So we know, for instance, that this year was a warm year and that year was a cold year. Um, there's some uncertainty because we don't have a perfect uh, uh, mesh of, of, of temperature stations all around the world. And that's kind of measured by these green bars, which get bigger as you go deep into the past. Uh, and deep into the past here means 1880, so the 19th century. Um, what you can see is that since the 19th century, temperatures have, uh, have risen. Uh, this is 2014, which was the warmest year in this record. Uh, 2015 is, is up here. Uh, so far, uh, we've got three months to go. Um, and you can see this like kind of large scale, uh, large scale warming, uh, particularly since about the 1970s. Right. But then you look at the scale on the end here. Right? This is in Celsius. So we're, like, we're math people, right? We, we know to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. We don't need to be pandered to, right? Do you need to be pandered to? OK, you need to multiply it by 1.8 to get Fahrenheit. OK, so um, what, what, is the, what is the scale here? Minus 0. 0.4 to 0. 0.6. So that's one degree Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't seem like a very big number, right? So since we've been sitting here, given that we're all radiating about 100 watts uh, all the time, the temperature in this room has increased by more than this. And yet none of you have become extinct, and the chairs have not melted yet. <laughs> So, so the question that you have to ask is not, like, what's the absolute temperature? Right? But, but what, should we be, what should we be comparing it to? Right? So temperature in a room, we can deal with you know, one or two degrees, and uh, we're just going to feel a little bit sweaty, and we're, we're OK. Uh, but for a planet, what's a reasonable temperature change for a planet? So um, we can compare it, for instance, to, uh, to the Ice Age. Right? So about 20,000 years ago, where we're standing was under about a mile of ice. Which is, that's a lot of ice. Um, the, uh, the ice sheets came all the way down from the Canadian archipelago um, and uh, all the way down to Brooklyn. Right? That's, that's where they stopped. OK, so if you're, if you're in Brooklyn, you're in Prospect Park, and you're looking down Prospect Park, and you see like a little um, set of hills kind of halfway down, that's the terminal moraine for the last Ice Age gla uh, glacier. So that's where it got to. And it was pushing stuff ahead of it. And that's as far as it went. And then it disappeared. So it was pretty cold then, right? You know, if you've got a mile of ice over New York and ice all the way from here to, uh, to the Arctic. Um, so how, how, how cold do we think the whole planet was relative to, to today? So uh, no, let's, let's, let's do a little poll. So. Um, who thinks that the planet was maybe 50 degrees colder? It doesn't really matter what the unit is. <laughs> OK, so let, let's stick with Fahrenheit. 50 degrees Fahrenheit colder. Anybody think the planet was that cold? No. 40 degrees colder. 30? OK, a few 30s. 20 degrees colder? All right, you see, that, I mean, that seems like it's cold, right? 10 degrees colder? All right, 8 degrees colder. That, you see, like, I, I changed the pattern. That was a clue. Yeah. Right? You should have all put your hands up when I said 8 degrees. So yeah, so the planet as a whole was only 8 degrees Fahrenheit colder, even with all of those ice sheets and all that change in sea level, all of those different climate changes. It was only 8 degrees colder. We've gone up almost 2 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 100 years two than, that. than today. Um, where we're projecting things to be because of our increasing amount of carbon dioxide and things by 2100 is about 8 degrees warmer than where we started. Okay? So if we think not in terms of degrees, right, which is a little bit confusing, but you think of in terms of Ice Age units. Right? So from, from today to the Ice Age, that's one Ice Age unit. right? Cooler. From today to 2100, the end of the century, that's another Ice Age unit, but in the other direction. Okay? And if you think about what the planet was like one Ice Age unit ago, that was a completely different planet. There were mammoths and stuff. 
Oh, we're not going to have manus in the other one. Maybe with, you know, new DNA recombination. You know. But we're going to end up with a very different planet. But those are predictions. How do we know that those predictions are correct? Right? How do we know that we know anything about this system? How do we know that really we're talking about a climate change and not just an initial condition problem? Those are good questions. <laughs> so here are some simulations of what's been going on over the last 100 years or so. So this is, uh, this is a model up here, and this is the actual observation. And you can see as we're going through the years, this, it gets warmer, it gets colder, it gets warmer. That's weather, right? That's not predictable, right? That's, that's the, the trajectory on those loops. And the model and the real world are going to diverge. But as you get towards the end of the century, there's something, there's a pattern that kind of emerges that is the same in the model and in the observations. And that's the pattern that's part of that shift. That's your R going from 24 to 30. And it turns out that that is predictable. How do we know that it's carbon dioxide? How do we know about any of these things? We can test this, right? So here's that same data. And we can ask, well, all the different things that are going on, right? So there's been wobbles in the Earth's orbit. What impact would that have had on the, on the temperature? It was pretty flat. The sun has waxed and waned a little bit. Did that make a difference? No, not very much. There have been big volcanoes. You know, here, 91, there's a big volcano. And if you add up all of the three things that are the natural components, you end up with something that's very different from what we actually observed. Now, what about man-made things? Land use change, deforestation, that has an impact, but it actually cools the planet. Ozone pollution, smog, that warms the planet, but only a little bit. Aerosols, air pollution, that actually cools the planet. That's in the wrong direction. Greenhouse gases, chief among them carbon dioxide. That's warmed the planet more than we've actually observed if we only take that into account. If we add in all of the human things, right, all of those different effects, you end up with something that looks actually pretty close to what we see. And then, of course, if you add in the natural and the human effects all together, you end up with something that looks very similar to what we've actually observed. And so by doing this, you can make an attribution of all those changes. So here, this is an attribution to the volcano. There was a big volcano in 91, called the planet by about half a degree. But the main driver of what's been going on over the last century has been the increase in greenhouse gases. And this is predictable despite the chaos of the weather. This band that we have here, right, this, that's our estimate of what the chaotic component could do. Right? So the real world could oscillate inside this band just because of where you are on those loops. Right? That's not predictable. But the overall pattern, the overall shift, that is predictable because it's a boundary condition change, not an initial condition change. So what does that mean for the future? That's a little bit more problematic. Obviously, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. We don't know whether we're going to do something about our emissions. We don't know how our economy is going to develop. We don't know how technology is going to develop. So people make scenarios. These are three different scenarios. Um, this one here, aggressive mitigation, that would be uh, totally impossible. So uh, we don't really need to worry about that one. Um, business as usual, right? This is the one we need to worry about because that's, that's if we just don't do anything. If we just burn all of the coal, all of the oil, all of the methane hydrates, all of the tar sands, all of the oil shales, all of the shale gas, uh, and we don't care about anything. And then you end up with something like that. And then this is perhaps the serious mitigation scenario is perhaps where we could end up if we, if we do things um, in, a, in, a, in a serious uh, but not totally impossible way. Look at the numbers here. Four degrees C, right? So multiply by 1.8. You can do that. Right? <laughs> Argentina is the only thing. Uh, or just south of Iceland. If you, had a, if you had an island just south of Iceland, it would be OK. Um, it's a little bit unclear what's going on there. Um, 
but the patterns that you see are pretty clear, right? This is um, warming in the Arctic that is totally unprecedented throughout, you know, the last uh, three million years. Um, these are temperatures up here that are, like I said, one ice age unit in the other direction. And this is this is what we got to deal with, right? This is these are these are the choices that that we have as a society. Um, you know, do we do this? Do we try for this? Do we try for this and fail and get that? That might be an okay solution. But even this, this is going to be serious, right? This is four degrees where we are, four degrees in the Arctic. That's no more summer ice. Um, you know, if you, if you really care about polar bears, that's bad news for the polar bears. Um, it's uh, good news for wine growers in southern England. Uh, um, uh, compared, to, compared to champagne, uh, but that's, that's a pretty small uh, benefit for a pretty large, uh, pretty large cost. This is predictable, despite the fact that this is a chaotic system. And we wouldn't know any of these things if it hadn't been for, for, for computers, right? It's, it's our ability to, to calculate all these things that both allowed us to identify chaos as a phenomena and then deal with the fact that these systems are chaotic in making predictions uh, going forward. Now, there's one question that, that, that should come to mind. And, uh, and, and let, me, let me ask it for you. Well, these are models, right? And you can demonstrate very easily that a model is chaotic just by changing that last decimal point and seeing things diverge but you still only have one planet. How do we know that the planet really is chaotic and it isn't just too complicated for us to see? And that's actually a very interesting question. And it turns out that there are ways to see chaos even in one single time series, uh, even though you can't do that sensitive um, dependence of two initial conditions test. And it turns out that the weather is chaotic. Dripping taps are chaotic. These magnets uh, and like answer bull things are chaotic. Um, bizarrely enough, uh, upside down double pendulums are chaotic. I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is a, this is a great um, video. If you have an upside down pendulum and you make it move up and down at the bottom here, you can stabilize it and it will just do a weird wobbly thing. But it will stay stable, but it will be it. It will do it in a chaotic manner. It's very impressive. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that hardly ever happens to me. I'm like, normally, I can just keep on talking, and I can find some thread of, of coherent thought and, and just find a way out. But no, I just I completely fail. Um, <laughs> chaos. Yes, very <laughs> complex. <laughs> Climate, also very complex, but yet predictable. So there you are. <laughs> OK, questions? <laughs> All right, you two at the front here were very quick, so yes. Uh, why is the European model um, better than the American model? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, <laughs> the European model, American model, you're talking about the weather forecasting models, you're not, you're not talking about the climate models. Yeah, um, and in particular, they're hurricane forecasts. Um, it turns out that, the, uh, that uh, on two really big occasions, the European model has done a much better job than the American model. And the two big occasions were Sandy, where the European model had Sandy impacting New Jersey um, 10 days out, whereas the American model only had it like after five days or something. And uh, Hurricane Joachim uh, very recently, where the European model had it going off out to sea, and all the other models had it impacting North Carolina, and it went out to sea. So um, those are two just kind of anecdotal things. Uh, and actually, the, the, the matches to the models are actually, they're, they're closer than that seems. But they are, the, the European model is slightly better. One of the ways that they're better is how they assimilate the observations. So weather models work by having a lot of physics, understanding about the whole system, and then you bring in the observations that you have right now, and then you let it go. So that on that, on that Lorentz plot, it's like finding 
a part of that phase space and then just starting off. Right? Um, and you can, uh, you can just do that. You just take the three-dimensional field of all the data and then you just go forward. And that's called 3D VAR, data assimilation. Now, you can go one step further and you can say, okay, well, I don't just know what today was. I also know what yesterday was. So I have a trajectory. So I know where it was. I know where I am. And I know what the, what the transition was. Right? So that's called, that's the fourth dimension, like time. And if you use 4D VAR, which is what the Europeans use, you don't, well, you don't just start where you're supposed to start, but you also start in the direction that it's going. And so that turns out to be a more powerful um, and more successful way of doing it, but it's much more expensive. So you need a bigger computer to be able to do that uh, because you're, you're doing a lot more calculations. So partly the, uh, the difference is that methodology, and partly it's a function of kind of just where we are in terms of funding and computers and who works on these things. So um, it's, it's partly structural and it's partly because of the way they're doing things. The, the, the Americans will be moving towards a 4D VAR assimilation system. Um, and so they're hoping to, to catch up with, uh, with the Europeans uh, pretty quickly. Um, but that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and then you, yeah. In all this, the Nino, El Nino mm -hmm. is considered? So uh, when you look at these, uh, these points here, where it was really warm, that was generally an El Nino year. So this was 1997, 98. That was a really big El Nino. Uh, 1941 was also a very big El Nino. Um, and 2015, 2016 is also a very big El Nino year. Um, and in the Pacific, this is a totally dominant phenomenon. Um, you can predict it about six months ahead of time, which means that you can have some hope of doing uh, seasonal forecasting for places that are affected by El Nino. Uh, so Indonesia, South America, um, Australia, Brazil, you can make good um, estimates of what's going to happen uh, to, to the weather there. Uh, you can try and do that for California, but it doesn't work quite as well. I mean, there's some predictability, but not a huge amount. Um, and that's like, uh, you know, where you saw the, uh, on the Lorentz thing, where the ensemble kind of stuck together for a long while. So when there's a, an El Nino, you have more of that uh, coherence. Uh, when there isn't one, then things are kind of more jumbled, and you don't have that level of predictability. How do you know that R is changing and not just this is just part of the random observation that you're normally seeing? So in the real world, we know that the boundary conditions are changing because we can measure that the sun is going up and down. We can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. We can measure the fact that uh, we've got a lot of deforestation. All of those things are real physical aspects. And you can demonstrate very clearly that those things change the weather. They change the climate. Because if you chop down a forest, it changes the way the water gets cycled. It changes the clouds. It changes the temperature. It changes the radiation. If you change carbon dioxide or you, or you change the amount of particles in the air, that changes how radiation comes from the sun and hits the surface or comes out. So you, you know that, that you are changing those R's. I, I guess his, I was assuming R was just some sort of parameter, but you're saying these are things that are actually in your model as carbon dioxide, sun effect. Right, right. So, so these models actually have physics in them. So you have... You know, you have radiation that comes in, and you see, OK, how much of it is going to be absorbed? How much of it is going to go through? How much of it is going to get reflected? And that depends on what's in that box. You know, how much dust is there in that box? Is there a cloud in that box? Is there any gr greenhouse gas in that box? Right. So you actually put in the physical thing. Yeah. OK, all the way at the back. How, d how do you find uh, whether or not a, a single time series, like the readings of the Earth, are, right. um, are show chaos? Um, so there are, okay, this is uh, kind of technical and I'm not going to get this right, so, um, so just pretend that I do get it right. Um, so there are certain measures of a single time series, uh, and particularly um, when you average over longer and longer periods uh, that look like chaotic time series uh, that, that you wouldn't have in a time series that was either just white noise or that was... Um, uh, like some more simple dynamical system. And so you can, you can actually, you can pull out um, like a Lyapunov exponent just from a single time scale. And that, if it's, if it's the right kind of exponent, then you can say, oh, well, that's, that's a chaotic system. Um, all the way at the back again. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. 
So how are, um, how are you predicting the climate 100 years from now? Are you taking many trajectories and seeing that they lead to roughly the same conditions? Yes, that's, that's, that's exactly right. So um, you have some uh, scenario for how the background conditions are going to change, the, the amount of greenhouse gases, the, um, the amount of deforestation. Uh, you have those things. And then you do a whole bunch of, uh, of different models, uh, different simulations, different initial conditions. So you're trying to average over the chaotic aspect and find the things that are robust uh, that are only a function of the change in the background condition, that are only a function of the change in R and not just a function of like where I happen to be on the, on the circuit. And you test them on historical data, I assume? So, you so this is, uh, I, sh I showed you a, uh, a set of hindcasts um, for the 20th century, but we can go back and we can test it against the ice ages, we can test it against um, you know, uh, weird events 8,000 years ago where this lake uh, burst and changed the circulation in the North Atlantic. Uh, we can test it against um, the mid-Holocene where the orbit of the Earth was just slightly different and that led to uh, a green Sahara as opposed to a desert Sahara. Uh, we can test it against a lot of things that have happened in the past, yeah. And we can actually do real forward predictions, right? So uh, when Pinatubo went off, it went off in June 1991. The models that we had at that time were not very sophisticated compared to what we have now. But people said, oh, well, this is a big volcano. That's going to have an effect. And they did the simulations for uh, the impact of Pinatubo before any of that actually happened. And they published that. They submitted it, I think, in October. It was published in January of 92. And they predicted that over the next two years, the climate would cool by about 0.3 to 0.5 degrees Celsius. And in fact, that's exactly what it did. So you can do real-time predictions for big events. And you can do predictions, of course, uh, we did predictions back in the 80s for what would happen in the 20th century. And that also came true. So you can do real forward predictions. You can do hindcasts. And you can do out-of-sample tests by going back into the paleoclimate. OK, just close here. You know. I don't, I don't want to. So, I can, you know. so, <laughs> so what's, what's the variance in your prediction for 2100? In other words, if your convergent uh, models here uh, predict the average increase of 0.6 uh, Celsius, how, how bad could it be or how uh, good could it be? That's a very good question. So um, the range that you have, given a particular scenario, right, because I don't control the economy or technology of things, um, given a particular scenario, uh, one of those mid-range scenarios, the kind of serious mitigation ones, um, with the same inputs, Different models would give you, uh, you know, a range of, you know, maybe three degrees warmer than today to five degrees warmer than today, right? So that would be the that would be the range of uncertainty. So it's not negligible, right? There's a big difference between three and five, um, but you know that's what we have to live with at this point. Yep. I mean, of course, with all of the knowledge in the world, with the most accurate models, it's still, you know isn't going to mean anything without human cooperation. So I know we're in the math museum, but I'm curious what your prediction is, non-mathematically, of the human response to this continuation over the next 100 years. I'm a mathematician. You can't ask me <laughs> humans. Um, so it, it depends on the day. Um, you know, sometimes I, uh, I, see, I see people being rational, coming up with plans, tr trying and failing to do the best they can, but, but making progress and having rational conversations. And other times I wake up and see that uh, congressmen are subpoenaing scientists' emails because they don't like the answer that we produced. And I think, oh, really? So it, it, it depends. I mean, Things have moved on. Like you might, it might seem like nothing has really changed since we started talking about this in the 80s, but it has. You know, back in the, you know, I've been, I've been working on this since like the mid 90s, 95, 96. Um, back then, the question that people were always asked was, so is it real this global warming thing? Is this something I have to worry about? And uh, now people don't ask me that. Now people ask us about, well. Uh, how do we deal with black carbon and methane and carbon dioxide in the same, uh, in the same breath? How do we deal with uh, the co-benefits of changing uh, fuel systems? How do we measure what happens when we change the CAFE standards? 
Uh, so the questions that we're being asked by people who are actually making decisions are actually much more sophisticated than they used to be. And uh, I think that the, uh, the, the, the kind of international community has got a little bit more um, savvy about what they can get groups of countries and, and individual countries to do. So I think the, um, the, the Paris talks that are upcoming, COP21, um, they've designed it so they can't really fail. Uh, by instead of telling people or trying to negotiate what everybody should do, they're just asking people what they can do. And of course, they will all agree to do what they said that they were going to agree to do. Um, but I think that's a, that's a good way forward because the, the way that we actually are going to end up reducing emissions is by taking a lot of best practices, changing a lot of little things, then changing a few big things. Um, and we're going to have to learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, and that's going to be a piecemeal thing. Uh, the, the, the best, um, though not perfect, analogy to what's going on is, is what happened with uh, ozone depleting chemicals, right? CFCs. So some of you are old enough to remember that we used to spray our armpits to, to prevent them um, from smelling. And the, the propellant in those spray cans uh, turned out to be uh, an ozone depleting uh, chemical, which was discovered in the 1970s. Um, by the time that they got together and signed an accord to say, well, maybe we shouldn't do that quite so much, that was 1988, right? So that was, that was a good uh, 15 years later. Uh, by the time they actually came to an agreement to actually cease the production of CFCs, that was in 1995. So that was a 20-year period from scientific discovery of a problem, discussion, re uh, replication, um, you know, observation, the ozone hole, which was a complete surprise. And then negotiation and uh, finding replacements and finding new technologies and finding ways to deal with it. That was a 20-year period. But that was an easier problem, right? There were only half a dozen manufacturers of these chemicals. Uh, they weren't used in every single thing that we take for granted. Um, and it turns out that we can, in fact, live without spraying our armpits. <laughs> uh, though that was not at all obvious if you listened to the, uh, if you read the Wall Street Journal at the time. The problem that we have with carbon is much bigger. Carbon is everywhere. Carbon is in the lights. Carbon is in the subways. It's in, the, it's in our clothes. It's in our food. Everything, obviously. <laughs> um, but emissions come from all of those things. And so we're all kind of complicit in adding to the burden of emissions. And so changes to that system uh, are going to be a lot bigger. And we have to make a much bigger change. Right? The difference between that business as usual and the serious mitigation is cut by the end of the century of like 80% in carbon emissions. That's an enormous challenge, right? It doesn't have to be done tomorrow, but even in 50 years or in, or in 60 years, that's a really, really big challenge. Um, and so I think it's, it's optimistic for us to think that we can just do it as quickly as we dealt with ozone. Now, that's not to say that it's quick enough, right? And this, you know, when you saw even with serious mitigation, we're still going to have a continuing amount of global warming. Um, but, you know, we are moving in that direction. And so sometimes I feel that that's, that's optimistic, and other times I think that, oh, my God, it's not enough. But it, like I said, it depends on the day. Uh, yes, in the front. Do any of the models take into account, um, like, the impact of meteors in the climate or anything like that? Uh, actual meteors, like, <laughs> kind of meteors? Yeah, like the impact that would have on the climate. Um, so generally speaking, meteors don't have a big impact on climate. Uh, they have done in, in history, of course, right? The, uh, the meteor that took out the dinosaurs, there, there were some climate changes going on right there. Um, but, uh, you know, should that happen again, then really all of our discussions are pretty moot. So it doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the level of meteor, the micro meteors that are adding, that are, that are always happening, um, they're too small to, to have an impact on the, on the climate. Good question. Anything hey, else? Oh, yeah, here in the front. I'm really struck by that example that you gave about uh, the Hudson River, or what we now call the Hudson River being frozen. Yes. And I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying there was only an eight degree difference. Now, do you mean like the, at the average coldest that it would be in New York City, it was only eight degrees colder no. than that? No, no. In, in New York City, it was much colder, right? There was an ice sheet. Right? Well, right, so, but so the sun was still coming out and so on. So it was cold enough to keep the right. ice frozen, but it was still... Right. So, but the, the, uh, so what happens when, um, when you have a big climate change, and you saw that a little bit in those patterns, the, the high latitudes 
uh, warm and cool much more than the tropics. And the tropics are actually half the planet, right? Um, and the temperature changes in, in, uh, in the tropics are much smaller. Uh, they're still going to be significant, um, but they're about half the size of the temperature changes uh, here. So how is the mean calculated then? Well, the mean is area weighted over the whole thing, but the tropics are the biggest part of it. So, they to they, so the small change there dominates over the much larger change in the poles. Well, I think that's one of the reason people don't really quite get it because they're thinking of only where they live yes. and and it you know unless they really notice they're perspiring in the middle of January where they normally are wearing fur or whatever they don't <laughs> you know they don't it doesn't, they right. don't get it you know right. and uh, i think the pictures of the polar bears have started get make them quite serious yeah so it. Yeah, the polar bears are interesting um i have i have a great picture of a polar bear like kind of like right right up close um and it kind of staring at me with hunger in its eyes. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very, they're scary, they're scary beasts. Uh, cute though. Um, people do notice things, right? They, 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 they notice that plants are flowering earlier, right? Um, they notice that streets on the coast are flooding more often, right? Because sea level rise is happening at the same time that uh, the temperatures are warm. Um, people notice uh, heat waves, though they don't always remember how hot everything was uh, back in the day. They remember like total amounts of snow, right? So, um, you know, you were all in New York last winter, I imagine, and everyone said, oh my God, how cold it is. But I'm a native New Yorker. I remember we used to have real winters, and we right. haven't had real okay. winters in a long time. So you're, you're, abs you're absolutely correct. A lot of people thought, oh, this is so cold because it was unusually cold. But that was, that was a totally average year for uh, the 20th century. Like, the cold years in the 20th century were much, much colder than the winter that we just had. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, most people don't remember these things, and they, and they, don't, they don't work it out. But, uh, you know, that's why we keep records, and we can actually check these things. So, yeah, great question. Um, yes, there, and then, then behind you. Can chaos theory be used to predict uh, uh, volcanoes or earthquakes? Um, so, as far as we can tell, volcanoes go off randomly. You know, there are times when there's a lot of them. There's times when there aren't very many. Um, but there's no, there's no deterministic pattern uh, behind that, as far as we can tell. Um, earthquakes, initial earthquakes, almost impossible to predict, because that's, that's a, a very um, tightly threshold event. Um, so those do look like they are random. Now, things like aftershocks are more predictable. Um, and I, I mean, I have some friends who work on that, and I could ask them whether whether that is in fact a chaotic process. But I don't, I don't actually know. Right behind you. Do you want? Uh, another not particularly mathematic qu mathematical question. Um, so you said that the planet obviously was a completely different place, uh, eight degrees Celsius lower. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Five, five degrees. Excuse Celsius. me. Uh, uh, what do you think it would be like, or is there any way to really predict what it would be like and the impact it would have if it was 8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in 100 years? I mean, what would the planet even look like? So what we have are, are these simulations, right? And we have some analogs from the past for when, from when it was warmer. Um, one of the things that happens is that the, the, the tropical circulation expands. So you've got a lot of rain right on the equator, and then you've got these kind of dry areas to the north and south. We expect that that's going to expand. And so by 2100, that's going to expand quite a lot. Uh, so places that are kind of in the arid zone now are going to be more in the arid zone. Places that aren't quite are going to be. Um, uh, we're going to see things moving poleward. Plants, animals, where they can, are going to move poleward. We're going to see a, a greening of the tundra, which is great for the tundra, but not really for anybody else. Um, Sea level rise, that's, and that's really, that's really the, the, the big one, because sea level rise is dependent mainly on uh, the changes in ice on Greenland and Antarctica. And we know very strongly that Greenland is losing mass at about 250 gigatons a year. Um, and we know for certain that the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and the, ice and, the Iceland and the Antarctic Peninsula are also losing ice at a very rapid rate. There was a paper that just came out yesterday talking about East Antarctica. Um, and so there's some, there's some ambiguity there. Uh, but we know that sea level is rising, and we know that sea level rise has accelerated as we've warmed, both warming the ocean, which expands the sea on its own, and melting ice everywhere else, which is also adding to the, to the situation. 
Um, the last time that the planet was uh, three, four, five degrees warmer than it is now uh, was in the Pliocene. That was about three million years ago. And I see the level rise then was about um, 60 feet compared to today. So the, so the shoreline for the Pliocene is in the middle of New Jersey. Wow. Okay, now, it takes a long time because obviously, you know, that isn't going to happen in just 100 years. But that's kind of where you're headed. Um, and so, yeah, that's, um, you know, uh, you know I, 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 have, I have advised people not to buy uh, basement property in Battery Park City for <laughs> obvious reasons. But should we be in that situation, uh, you're not even going to be buying, right. like, the top floor of that ridiculously yeah. large tower building that they just built on yeah. uh, 57 Park. Yeah. <laughs> One, or two One or two more questions. Yes. I was just wondering, does it make any sense if you ran these equations backwards? No, it doesn't, uh, because they're not, re they're not time reversible. Uh, so these are dissipative equations. So um, you have energy coming in. It gets, there's entropy, right? And, uh, and then you throw out lower entropy energy back out in, in infrared. So you're, um, so you're always increasing entropy, right? If you ran it backwards, you, that would not be physical. And in fact, what you would end up with is, is something that blows up very quickly. Uh, you run it backwards in these hindcasts by starting earlier and running it forwards, right? But you don't ever just go backwards. You can't do that. Last question here in the front. Are there any other models out there for climate that contradict this model? Um, so there's lots of other models for climate. Uh, so pretty much every country that thinks of itself as a scientific, uh, that has a scientific enterprise, has, has produced their own model. Um, so the Chinese, the Japanese, the French, the Germans, the UK, um, uh, the Italians, uh, the Australians. Uh, there's three models in the US, and they all give the same answer. All right, let's all give right. a round of applause for our speaker tonight.